Welcome everyone to Blended Learning, meeting the literacy needs of all learners. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, before we get started, I would like to introduce you to Nikki Burns. Nikki is an administrator at Fane Elementary School and a program specialist and a longtime user of Reading Horizons Blended Learning Curriculum and has some wonderful experiences. Nikki? Hi, it's nice to be with you all today. Thank you, Reading Horizons, for allowing me to come and, and share my testimony about what we feel about Reading Horizons in our school system. I'm in Dothan, Alabama. It is a, um, is a 9,000 student school district in Lower Alabama on the Florida Georgia line. Um, we purchased Reading Horizons two years ago for our entire district. Uh, at that time, I was at the district as an instructional coach. Uh, we implemented it for intervention only at the time. The next year, I moved as the assistant principal at Jerry Lee Fain. Um, we have 412 students. We are a Title I school with 99% free and reduced lunch. Uh, we are also a STEM signature. Uh, we use Reading Horizons here at Fain as our core reading program. Most of our students come um, two to three grade levels below, and we know that the foundation, if we don't have the foundation for phonics and phonemic awareness, then we will not be able to do our comprehension. So we do this K-6 as our core uh, phonics program. Uh, they do it for their 30 to 45 minutes a day. They use the program explicitly to fidelity. They use um, all of the core four daily, and then we move into the software portion. Uh, the students love the software portion. Uh, they really feel successful when they can go and transfer their practice that they have done in their daily with their teacher. One of the things that we have seen is for the first time in years, our students are able to actually get the words off the page. And that was something that they had not been able to do. So once they learned all of the cues and all of the, the system of Reading Horizons, we started seeing um, them transferring that to all subjects. Uh, and you could see them marking on their paper during math time and walking down the hallway and saying, I know how to mark that word if it was a word on a bulletin board. So we started seeing successful practice from our children. Uh, we are still, we, we have just done it solid for one year. And then of course COVID hit. We used the um, online platform at home as much as we could for our students, as well as used all of the Reading Horizons videos on our Facebook page, and we push it out to our kids as well as we could. Um, this program is successful for us. Um, I hope that you'll enjoy listening to what they're going to tell us today because as a person who loves reading, who's gone through the letters training, who is a Reading Horizons trainer, I can tell you that there are things in this program that blow my mind on the daily basis and um, just seeing successful children reading, I promise, will make your day. So that's all I have to say say about that and please if you have any questions about my school or about how we implement or any question about Reading Horizons um, you are free to to let us know in the chat box and we will answer them as we can. Hey thank you Nikki my experience is very similar and I'm Paul Black I'm the school psychologist here at Reading Horizons and in our reading clinic uh, RISE and I still practice as a school psychologist in the public schools very similar experience I've had wonderful success with my students um, making incredible progress with Reading Horizons and especially during COVID-19, blended learning and online learning was was not a heavy lift. It was, it was very doable and, and dare I say simple for us to accomplish when it came to our reading instruction because of Reading Horizons. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce to you our, our speaker, our presenter, Chantelle uh, Barrett, and she is our reading science and dyslexia specialist and also national trainer. And she has a wealth of knowledge and experience. And um, um, without further ado, Chantel. Thanks, Paul. Good morning and afternoon for some, wherever you're joining us from. I'm excited to be here with you today and share this important information about blended learning, especially as both Nikki and Paul have talked about the importance of being able to pivot in a, in a virtual classroom. Um, if we find ourselves in that situation again and what that looks like. So I want to start off by just getting some information and I want this to be as interactive as possible today. I'm going to ask for some 
feedback in the chat, but also a couple of polls, because I want to kind of gauge where you're at so that I can target what I'm talking about too. I want to know if blended learning is utilized in your school or district. Yes, yes, but not being implemented effectively. No, but you're hoping to implement a blended learning model. Just kind of want to get a feel for where everybody is at. Good. Okay. Okay, so yeah, we've got about some that have it, um, but maybe not being used effectively, um, but hoping to implement, and then some that just are hoping to implement that. So that's our intent today, to be able to walk through some of the benefits of a blended learning model, talk about the most common blended learning models, um, and specifically how we can fit in and support those as well. So I want to talk first about those benefits of a blended learning model, go into specifically structured literacy in a blended learning model, which is what Reading Horizons is, and those available resources to support blended learning. Some free things you can try out and get your hands on as you're making decisions and thinking about what things are going to look like for you moving forward. So let's talk about some of those benefits of a blended learning model. So first of all, let's talk about what blended learning is. So, and I love this, it's really about bringing the power of teachers and the power of technology together. When blended learning first came out, it was kind of this, a little bit of a disconnect. It's like, well, we should have technology in the classroom. And it wasn't necessarily speaking to each other. A true blended model is when what is being used as far as technology is supporting that classroom instruction, extending the reach of the teacher, providing that detailed data um, to be effective in what we're doing within the classroom. So it's really about making sure that those two are working together to be effective. So one of the things that has um, really helped me was Tazi Young, who's a guru in blended learning. Um, he talked about how when people come to him and ask him, you know, okay, so how do we put blended learning in our schools? Um, he said, you know, they're, just not, they're not always asking the right questions. Here's some of the questions that we need to start with. You know, what are we trying to do, first of all? Um, so what's the problem to be solved? It's like building that house from the foundation up. So is it making sure that we are extending the reach of the teacher? Is it to provide more data-driven instruction? What is the, what are we trying to do? What's the end goal? Zooming out for what purpose? What are the results that we're looking for based on that? So it's not just, well, we need to fill time with technology, so let's just get something that they can play on, right? So it's about making sure that's a really informed decision, decision again, like we've already talked about, that those are correlating. And then it's about looking at, okay, if we're gonna start building this, we're gonna talk about the type, um, we're gonna talk about some of those models, those blended learning models, what type of model and design do we want to do that will help clarify then what kind of resources do we have in place and what can we build? What do we need to add to that? So those are some of the questions to be thinking about, um, especially those of you that are maybe reevaluating how yours is working. You know, what's the intent? What's the purpose? It's always about zooming out for what purpose and zooming in, how are we going to do this? And this is where we're gonna get a little bit more into the zooming in. So options for models and how you can bring that in. So we're talking about blended learning models. The most common ones I'm going to cover today, the rotation and the flex model. So the rotation model has about four different options and we'll just highlight a couple of those. Um, it's about moving through those centers. The rotation model is primarily what you'll see in an elementary setting, usually K-5, K-6 approach. So it's basically students are rotating through stations, one that's going to be teacher-led and one of which has technology. Um, again, the idea is that those are all collaborative, that it's not you're doing something separate in each center, that everything is focused on that same content to make sure that they're getting that differentiated, targeted instruction, the software is supporting that as well. Now, the lab rotation model is very similar to that. It's just that instead of having those, um, the technology within the classroom, students are going to a lab setting for that part of the rotation. Now the flipped classroom model, we start to see as we get into those upper grades a little bit more. The flipped classroom model is where the bulk of the instruction is coming from the technology and it moves the teacher to more of a mentor role. 
Um, so I love this, the traditional classroom, the teacher's role is sage on the stage, the flipped classroom, the teacher's role is guide on the side. So it's just kind of about shifting that where the technology is driving more of that instruction, which allows for more of that individual student pace and autonomy. And then the teacher gets to go more into that supportive mentor role of that guide on the side. The last of the rotation models is what's called the individual rotation model. And this is really driven by the individual student needs. So it wouldn't be necessarily a set, everybody has to go to the same station, everybody's gonna rotate through at a set time. Um, while there will be parameters there, not every student will go to every station. It's about making sure that there's a variety of stations to meet a variety of needs and then setting up that path for students individually based on their specific needs to accomplish their goals that we have. So those are the models. You've got the station rotation, what we traditionally see in a K-6 classroom. Some will do that lab rotation going to a lab setting during that time. And then the flex model and individual model where they have more autonomy, they're starting to move into that and the software is carrying that technology is driving that instruction a little bit more. So let's talk about some of the benefits and some things to be cautious about when you're looking at um, the rotation model. So some of the benefits for students, they get level daily interaction. That's a key reason why you know, those were brought in in the first place. Repetition, but again, if, they're not, if those aren't speaking to each other in those centers, they're not getting that repetition. So it's about having that um, correlation. So that repetition. Um, they're getting some choice within those skills. It's a great opportunity for both formal and informal assessment time. So one of the cautions um, that's coming out of the research now and the time that we've had to be able to be utilizing blended models and what's working and what's not. And one of the things that they're cautioning is for students who struggle, those that have processing issues, um, that they take longer. And so a lot of times when those station, when we're doing those rotation models, we have very limited time, right? It's like 10 minutes move, 10 minutes move. And some of the difficulties with that is students who take longer can get very frustrated because they won't be able to complete the task at the station. And so their anxiety just mounts with each rotation and they can just completely shut down by the end. So it's really important that we are mindful of setting appropriate times, especially for our students who are going to need more time. Have flexibility and let them know, you know, we're going to be able to have those stations available later. If you didn't get done with your with your project there or whatever, you can come back to it. Or maybe it's extending time where something like that individual rotation might be more beneficial so they don't have to go to all of them, but you're targeting specifically to what they need. So that's one thing to be mindful of that's coming out of the data now. So many benefits for students, and that was the one caution, is to be mindful that the time is appropriate for students for them to be successful and not just have mounting frustration in that experience. So some of the benefits for the teachers, leveled small groups, so we're targeting that instruction, allows us to specialize, you know, do specialized preparation, so we're focused on what those students need. It's data driven and we're getting that quick data, especially from that informal assessment within those centers, and it does allow us at times to move into that mentor zone. So this is our model in a K-3 setting. So we have two programs, Reading Horizons Discovery, that I'll talk more about um, that is for K-3, and Reading Horizons Elevate, that is 4th through 12th grade. When we are talking about the K-3 setting, it is very teacher-led. So in that blended model, it is very teacher-heavy. It is more of the station rotation or lab rotation. You can have some of that individual rotation, of course, um, but the software becomes an extension of that reach, but it is always driven by the teacher. And then that data is taken for that really targeted instruction um, in those small groups. So let's talk a little bit now about the flex model. It's the next most common um, model that we see in, in um, education. So with the flex model, it's more fluid. This is especially appropriate for students in the upper grades. So that's one of the things I'd like to see too today before I get into this a little bit more. I'd like you to put in the chat what grade levels you cover or what your specific role is if you're an administrator or what grade you're over as maybe a curriculum director or um, go ahead and just drop in the chat um, what that um, what grade you're covering and, and kind of what your needs are. Okay, K6, 612, principal, K5, administrative K2. Okay. Okay, running the gamut. Cool. All right. Yeah, so those of you that are over those upper grades, this is where you might experience more of a flex model where your students are having more autonomy. Good, keep those coming in. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Deborah, Bianca, thank you. Okay, 
Good, thank you all for putting those in. Okay, thanks Lauren. All right, so that flex model, um, they're able to move really wherever they want. They are the ones that are in control of what they need. So teachers provide support and instruction on a flexible as needed basis while students work through course curriculum and content. So the student becomes more of the driver of that pacing and the teachers just meeting them where they're at. Um, this is this is a tough one to think about sometimes as teachers um, to wrap our head around. There's definitely more flexibility with that in the upper grades, as I mentioned. But we know from the research on motivation that student autonomy and goal setting are incredibly important in maintaining motivation for students. So this is one of the ways that we can also increase student motivation is by bringing in a flex model where it's not quite as rigid. They're able to move through that um, by being the driver there and collaborating with the teacher on what is best for them to meet their goals. So some of those benefits for students, individualized and differentiated instruction, that's a key part of that, but the autonomy, again, which is such a critical part of motivation for students, which we see that um, as students are engaging in that flex model. Teacher support and um, intervention is provided in real time. So you're taking, so because the student's driving that, you're preemptively looking at that data. And when you're gonna work with that student in that small group or one-on-one, -on -one, then it's very targeted based on that data of what they did the day before, where they're at and what they might need. And then you're able to also respond right away. So some of the benefits for teachers, it shifts the role from instructor to mentor. It allows for immediate intervention and support and takes students take more ownership in their learning, which pulls some of that burden off of us as teachers. And again, it's because of that motivation, they're more engaged within it. So traditionally, you know, in, in a traditional classroom um, where the instructor 80% of the time maybe mentor 20% of the time the flex model really flips that so that we're only instructing about 20% of the time we're being a mentor that 80% the bulk of that time so the instruction is coming from the online platform just why we've got to make sure that it's a sound online platform that's providing that explicit instruction that's adaptive prescriptive all of those key pieces as well so let's look at now our second objective and get into what structured literacy looks like in a blended learning model um, for that data driven instruction, because again, that's one of the main benefits of utilizing blended learning is to have that data to drive what we're doing. So just to know, um, structured literacy is based on the science of reading. We are based on the science of reading. It is it is this vast body of evidence from multiple disciplines that is allowing us to find out what gives students the advantage to reading. What is the most effective type of reading instruction? We know one of the, one of the key models that came out of all the research that was proposed by Goffman Tumner in 1986 is the simple view of reading. It gave us this testable hypothesis to see what are the key elements of reading and how do they affect that overall goal of reading comprehension, which was proposed that reading comprehension is a product not a sum, a product of decoding and language comprehension. Now there's subcomponents, obviously, and other parts of both of those main components, but it's critical to understand these key roles and how we're giving those equal weight in our instruction for students. This, I came from a secondary background. I was a junior high and high school English teacher um, out of my undergrad and walked in there ready to teach the finer points of a fair pa five paragraph essay and totally blown away by how many students struggled and couldn't access the content I was supposed to be helping them acquire. And so I didn't understand, because their issue was their reading comprehension, but I didn't understand this. I was from a secondary background. I didn't understand that critical role of decoding um, and that it wouldn't compensate. Doesn't matter how great their language comprehension is. It's not a sum. One does not compensate for the other. Their language comprehension can be fine, but if that decoding is low, it is going to affect that reading comprehension. So one of the things that came out with the National Reading Panel when that report came out and we identified those five key areas of phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Every reading um, you know, program and um, the, the groups, um, the national groups, everyone was, a, everyone was able to jump on that bandwagon and agree and say, yep, phonics. What wasn't agreed upon or explicitly outlined was the way that those skills are taught. Um, which is largely ended in the results that we're seeing of our NAEP scores still not changing. 
Um, and so knowing how to address these skills is really important and then knowing how to do it well in a blended model so that it can pivot in a virtual time is important. So what the evidence is showing is that a structured literacy approach, which is based on the science of reading, is most effective for those foundational skills that it's explicitly teaching, those word identification and decoding strategies, utilizing um, these principles in our instruction, being systematic, cumulative, explicit, diagnostic, and teaching these key elements within um, this circle. So these are things that I wanna just talk about how we can teach those elements and still bring in those principles of explicit, systematic, cumulative, and diagnostic instruction in a blended model. So Nikki actually mentioned this. She said, you know, her students once, you know, they would go through the core four and then be able to transfer that into the software. And so let me explain what that is. So when you're talking about being systematic and having a system, you want to use an instructional design that is sound and also based on evidence, which the gradual release of responsibility is that I do, we do, you do approach for any instruction. So the way that fits in and the way that the software can come in within this is gonna be dependent upon the model that you're um, implementing, whether that's the station rotation, whether it's a flex model, that's gonna vary that. So I'm gonna talk about the different models and how that fits into that gradual release. It's gonna come at different times. So when we're talking about fitting into um, kind of a block of instruction, it's around 30 minutes, um, but that we would extend that transfer time. And that's where the transfer would come into some of those rotations. So because structured literacy is a cumulative approach, you always want to start with a review of those previous skills. It acts more as an informal formative assessment to determine if students have those previous skills, because we're going to build upon those. Then we go to that direct instruction and modeling. Now, this is one of the things that's critical too. We don't want them having 30 minutes of instruction that's very hands-off, even if it's teacher-led. We want that very targeted, brief, intentional, um, and getting them right to that guided practice where that learning is going to continue, but we know students do better with that hands-on learning, so we want that to come in very quickly after that initial instruction in modeling and then making sure that students are transferring and that they're transferring their skills to text but also that they're transferring and practicing that independently with additional reading and writing activities to make sure that they can release that we can release that for them gradually and they can take autonomy over that now again you're going to have kind of a flipped model in some of those upper grades so i'll show that so let's talk about specific um, per grades and per program so reading horizons discovery as i mentioned um, is going to have that teacher being the driver of the instruction um, and the software is an extension of that reach and the teachers are then taking that data to further drive that direct instruction and that's in that small group and one on one. So traditionally in, in this setting discovery is utilized in a lab rotation or a station rotation. Okay, now you can utilize it um, in that individual. Um, if you've got a little bit older students that you can target and you have some support in the classroom to help them not go to all the stations, but particular ones to their needs. So what this looks like, let's break down that core four of um, specifically looking at instruction, um, dictation or that guided practice and, and then transfer and what that looks like in both settings. So it's definitely going to start, that explicit instruction is gonna be by the teacher. Um, it can be done digitally as well. So one of the things just to, to make you aware of during this time, so we, um, we have um, PowerPoints created for teachers to be able to to support their instruction in the classroom. Um, and that was able to pivot nicely in a virtual setting because then the teacher's not trying to have to write on the board. Um, you can just pull that up and that instruction just flips nicely and pivots nicely into that um, virtual classroom. And we recorded, our implementation coaches recorded um, all of the lessons of the program that are available um, for students to be able, like if you send that to the students, they can watch that and get that instruction in that virtual time. All teacher materials, this is something when you're looking at a blended learning model too, are all teacher materials available digitally so that you could pivot. Um, this is more even important in that virtual classroom. So are all materials available digitally, which ours are. We have a Reading Horizons Accelerate teacher portal where everything that the teacher would need to teach um, is linked together with those lessons and available digitally, which allows them to pivot nicely. The software again should be instructional. So when you're thinking about a blended learning model, um, you don't want to necessarily have the teacher instruction and then it just practice or games on the online component. You want it to be instructional and you want it to be adaptive and prescriptive with those assessments for those data, that data tracking so that that is also extending that reach 
and differentiating, providing that differentiated instruction. So what this can look like in a traditional classroom, just focusing on instruction. So the teacher can guide that instruction, presenting the skills whole class, and then differentiate from there in that small group setting, or you can just start small group. And then one of those station rotations or a lab rotation would be the software. So it doesn't, it doesn't, one of the great things too to be mindful of, I think this makes us nervous as educators is, well, they only go to the lab once a week. Um, I'm going to be teaching four or five lessons in the classroom. They're not going to be able to line up. Um, the beauty of a, that one that software is instructional is that then it becomes this great a spiral effect. It becomes a review or preview for students. So it doesn't have to directly align with where the teacher is. Um, it just becomes another reinforcer um, repeated, which is one of those benefits of, of that rotation model anyway. So that's something to be mindful that doesn't have to exactly match. If they're only going a couple of days a week, that's fine. Becomes a review or a preview for students to go at their own pace if they're ahead of the teacher. So in guided practice, one of the things that is so critical in structured literacy, particularly in an Orton Gillingham Orton Gillingham based program like Reading Horizons is, is a multi-sensory component to connect all those language centers. This is a critical part of getting to um, that targeted response of going through what is identified as the phonological loop and the orthographic loop involved in language. So they're seeing it, they're saying it, they're hearing it, they're writing it, and they're reading it. And that's what helps us get to that targeted response. I'm gonna show you um, just really quickly an example of dictation and it is being mirrored in a virtual classroom too and you can see that on those lessons and they're accessible free. We'll talk about those in line with the other resources you can look at as you're contemplating a blended learning model. So I wanna just show you this um, example. Um, this is a second grade classroom mainstream in the Midwest um, just to watch this process and I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions about it. Tent, tent. Turn around and write your word. I use a tent when I go camping. Okay, so just the process. I'll explain kind of what they were doing a little bit later, but what are some of the things that stood out to you in that process that you can put in the chat? Did anything stand out to you in that, in that process? What did you notice? What were the students doing? Body motions, multi-sensory, awesome. Modeling what she did, good, yeah. So in that time, the teachers, you know, they're having those hand motions, they're listening to it, modeling that active listening. Yes, Catherine immediately applying, um, immediate production of language, hearing it, writing it, um, oral language, good, yep. So they're, they're hearing it, they're saying it back, they're turning and writing it and producing that. Um, the teacher used it in a context sentence, which we'll talk about briefly. And then what wasn't filmed is then they would read it two times. So that's the other thing to be mindful about in a blended learning model too, is to make sure that there's their, um, yes, yep, Catherine used it in a context sentence, is to make sure that there still is, the great thing about an online component is, is it creates this um, visual interaction for students that is so, so powerful, but we still want to get students up on their feet and active engaged as part of those stations, as part of what we're doing um, to really activate all of those areas. That's such a critical part of a structured literacy approach. Um, so then we go into transfer. So right after that practice of dictation, they're practicing fluency building at the word and sentence level, and um, they can extend that to more independent activities to practice pages. We have created um, student packets that are still available free. So moving forward, if you find yourself in a virtual classroom again, or if even you're already having conversations for fall that you're gonna have half your students one day, half the next day, if students don't have, and I know this has been part of, you know, that we're trying to move to equity to make sure every student has access to um, technology and internet so that we can move forward at a, at, at a, at a, to be more equitable in that for students. But we know this has been an issue that not every student had access to internet or technology. And so with the videos, if they have a phone, you can send the video, they can still get that instruction. And then we have free packets that you can send home for students. So just to be mindful that those are available and they're available now and will be for you. Um, so when you're talking about guided practice, again, when you're looking at an online component, is it doing that gradual release as well? So we have, once that instruction is provided 
from that explicit instruction on the online platform, then you want to have activities there as well. With that gradual release, we have three. We have two in isolation and a third in context. Now, that's the other piece that, that you get nervous about. So they do the activities, do they just move on? So in an online, online platform, it's really important that it's adaptive. So if they struggle, do they get differentiated instruction? Do they get additional practice? Is the teacher alerted to let them know, yes, there's been an issue with the student on these activities? That absolutely has to be a part of what you're looking for in an online platform, which is something that we do, that if they struggle and drop below that passing percentage proficiency of 85%, they get differentiated instruction and practice, and a teacher is alerted in a message center to know how to help that student or students, depending on um, the number of students that are struggling with that. The final step when you're teaching these foundational skills of decoding is always to transfer it to connected text. So you want to have connected text in your online platform as well. So because what happens if you go to that virtual classroom, right? Can they keep doing that transfer? Because we can't always get those books home to them for a variety of reasons. So that's another key feature is the transfer available also on the online platform that you're looking at. So when you're talking about what this looks like in the traditional classroom, right after dictation, they would practice that fluency. We have whole class transfer cards for that choral reading fluency practice at the word and sentence level, individual student transfer cards at the word and sentence level for your center rotation time, and then the decodable text. And so we have those in print, so you can do those as one of the stations, um, but it is also digital. So they'll get that again, reinforce that, and be able in that virtual classroom, be able to, to pivot that really nicely. So again, just to, we're talking about structured literacy. We know from research how critical it is to practice with decodable text, um, especially in those early reading, um, so that they're connecting those neural pathways um, and getting that repeated exposure to make those connections. The other piece when we're talking about is I'm focusing more on those principles of structured literacy. So you can see we're using, you know, we're cumulative, we're using that explicit instruction, we're using that gradual release of responsibility and that diagnostic in the splendid piece is so critical. So you want both to inform. So the nice thing is when you've got an approach where you've got um, both informal and formal assessment, that informal assessment, can you can even target certain things you want them to do on the online platform, but the online platform, again, is going to provide that formal instruction to further drive what you're doing daily, that it should be driven by that data. Um, that's going to be an important part of what you're looking at, because in a structured literacy approach, you want to make sure that students, skills are taught to student mastery, because we're building on those, we're cumulative, that's a critical part of what we're doing. So I asked Paul to come back on as a school site with his experience as a school psychologist to talk about how critical this piece was for his school with the diagnostic and what was happening for his students and also in, you know, during this time where we found ourselves in that virtual classroom. Well, what was great about when we implemented Reading Horizons is that it really streamlined and simplified a referral process. Um, having software that was prescriptive, um, diagnostic, and adaptive to the student needs, uh, the first year resulted in reducing my referral rate by 30% for students with reading disabilities. Part of that is, is that when a, a teacher would come to us saying, I have a student that I've identified that struggles with reading, we wouldn't have to sift through and try and figure out and decipher as a team what that looked like, you know, through work samples, through a packet they fell, um, filled out. Um, we could all be on the same page in moments, looking at the same data, uh, time on task, whether the intervention was done with fidelity, and then go through our processes. Um, it made a big difference. And, and teachers now were leaving, instead of frustrated that we were asking them to do this, this, and that, or questioning whether their intervention was done with fidelity, they were leaving with a tool, an effective intervention tool, that was going to do the progress monitoring for them. Um, it didn't burden the teacher. In fact, quite the opposite. Parents were a lot happier because they didn't feel like they were um, waiting and waiting and waiting for an effective intervention with the data so we could move on in the process or decide what we were going to do with that student. And so all around, this put us all on the same page and really streamlined our process. And when COVID hit, my students, they didn't have to learn something new. They didn't have to learn a new process. Um, it was a matter of, of logging on, doing their lessons, and then the teacher, like Chantel mentioned, went from the sage on the, the stage to the, um, the guide on the side um, seamlessly. 
because they had that consistency of instruction. They had a curriculum that could be repurposed for multi, multiple environments and multiple settings. And that was huge for us. Um, my students, their academic trajectory didn't change. Um, those uh, who we were progress monitoring for reading, they ended up where we expected them to end up. There wasn't that slide that you saw across the country. That was because we had a curriculum that we could be um, repurposed to a different setting seamlessly um, that was evidence-based and effective. Thanks, Paul. Um, and if there's questions for Paul specifically and his experience in that role and how they use that, put it in the chat. We'll come back around and, and answer those at the end as well, kind of what that looks like. And Nikki's going to be here for questions at the end as well. So again, that purpose and that blended piece is to be able to have that data to drive and further effectively do uh, make sure that what we're doing for that direct instruction is matching that data that we're getting. So we're talking about those upper grades, those students in fourth grade on up. This is where we get more into either the flipped classroom or individual rotation, if you're using a rotation model, or even that full flex model, where they're really guiding their instruction there. Um, because the, especially in a structured literacy approach, when we're talking about covering these foundational skills. So for Reading Horizons Discovery K3, we're mainstream and intervention. So we're across all three tiers and intervention. For Reading Horizons Elevate, for these skills, it's specifically intervention. So we're really targeting those individual needs, which is why a blended learning approach is so helpful. We know one of our issues in the classroom is being able to meet the needs of all the students at their varying levels. This allows that individualization um, to make sure they're getting that. And then again, being able to come in more as that mentor and have that immediate intervention provided targeted to that student. So in those upper grades and even in second and third, sometimes you'll go to a little bit of maybe that individual rotation, but really it's in the upper grades where we see more of that flipped classroom model and then the flex model where they're really driving that instruction. So let's look what it, um, how that might change when we're in that, in those upper grades. So the software is gonna be your driver of instruction for those students. You're gonna start the initial assessments that are adaptive and prescriptive. They're gonna get that detailed instruction based on where their deficits are and support them throughout and differentiate based on their ongoing responses. And again, all the teacher materials are available digitally. So if we land in that virtual classroom, you've got that as well. Um, and then recorded lessons. And this is something to be thinking about that can be helpful in supporting your teachers to be able to, a lot of times knowing how to provide that instruction virtually to have a model of how to do this. Your teachers can look at these lessons, um, these recordings and see just how do I even provide um, that instruction digitally or online. So what it looks like in the traditional classroom is still that software is going to be that driver, right? Either in that flipped model under that individual model or in that flex model where the software is providing the bulk of that instruction and the teacher's taking that data. And if there's areas of difficulty for students providing that direct instruction and particularly, as I mentioned, that important multi-sensory piece to connect those language centers, that's going to be important. That's something um, that the teacher is so critical for, for asking those questions as a mentor, for providing that intervention, um, and particularly providing that multi-sensory piece. So that guided practice, that dictation is still critical, even in a virtual classroom, so that they're going through all the sensory input and motor output to get that targeted response, and that can absolutely be mirrored even in a virtual setting. So when we go into that guided practice section, Again, in more of that flipped classroom, the student gets to have more autonomy about what guided practice looks like for them. So one of the ways that we even differentiate that on our program for older students on Elevate is that rather than the set activities, they have a certain number they can select from. They have a minimum number they have to do, but they even have more autonomy of choice. That's a game changer in motivation for students. You know, you've got four activities here, pick two or pick three, whatever that is the minimum required. So they feel like they have more control again over um, their practice. Um, I, there's also student packets available for the older students during this time. So if they don't have access to technology, that's an option. And again, these transfer cards that are for fluency practice, they have you have them in your hand in the classroom, but they're also available digitally on that teacher platform to put up for students to be able to continue that learning. So after they go through that instruction, whether that's coming from the software or a little bit of a combination of the teacher, they're going to get that guided practice here. But when you're talking about transfer, this is a great piece where the teacher 
teacher comes back in and maybe just listens to the student read. Are they, are, are they fluent at that word and sentence level and connected text? Can I check in on that for the students as more of an informal formative assessment? Students would start that word and sentence level fluency practice, then connected text, expository passages from first grade to 12th grade in 33 different categories for autonomy of choice and interest level, and they get to select those. And those are in print and online. So again, if your text is in both places, then you can continue that instruction, use that data to drive and inform each other in that blended model. So another great resource about having an online platform is options like building the vocabulary that they can do even more in depth than the teacher can do. You know, a full vocabulary tool where once they learn those, those orthographic patterns, those skills they're working on, they're getting to practice words that follow those skills and get related words, definition, context sentence, even in vocational areas for those upper grades. Um, all the text is there. They're able to get that Lexile assessment that will match their reader measure to the appropriate text measure. It'll open some to about 150 Lexile level above to push growth but not point of frustration and everything below is open for autonomy of choice. That autonomy of choice is key. They have to get a certain number of points but they get to select the passages. So look at that too because sometimes that can be demotivating in online platforms if they feel like there's the set, we want a controlled path but flexibility within that for the student to choose. That's critical. And to be able to gather that data. What's their words per minute? How do they do on comprehension so that we have again detailed data at the really foundational decoding skill level all the way up to their comprehension skill level. So as you know, Paul mentioned how great that was to have that consistency in the data, um, but a variety of opportunities. That's a critical part of structured literacy for both informal and formal assessment so that that daily instruction is being driven by that. So a couple of the things that I want to talk about um, resources available for you to look at in just a minute, but I want to show just a little bit about what we're teaching and how that how that gets done in a blended learning approach, get a little bit more into those elements. Um, because we have, whether that data is being gathered informally or formally, the great thing about um, our direct instruction materials is there's a differentiation table to provide even more ways to differentiate in a blended learning model based on student data. Those assessments on the Elevate program, like I mentioned, are adaptive and prescriptive, and it determines four different pathways for every single skill lesson. So look at that ability to individualize. That's a critical part of a blended learning model is making sure that it is meeting the individual needs of the students. That was really that when you talk about for what purpose is to meet students individually where they're at and what they need. So when these elements are addressed in a structured literacy approach, I want to talk about ways those that can be taught in a blended learning approach. So phonology, that's step one. We're talking about both phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. That's that understanding of sound. So we're teaching these skills. We want to teach those sounds. This is something that we do. We're focused on teaching those 42, those 44 sounds. A couple of those are come later. Um, but the beauty is then when you've got an online platform that allows students to go in and see, this is just a static um, screenshot, but it's an animated um, when they're live. All of those 42 sounds, they can see manner and placement of articulation. They can watch whether it's voiced or voiceless. They can see a live mouth produce that sound. They can record themselves, play it back, so that it gives them this other depth, this other layer to practice those sounds, to work on um, that within their instruction. When you're talking about the next step um, in those elements of sound symbol association and syllable instruction, that's when we're getting into phonics. Um, Reading Horizons is based on Norton Gillingham principles. We're structured literacy, so we're explicit, systematic, sequential. We do utilize a marking system. That marking system's purpose is to help students identify those critical orthographic patterns to determine that pronunciation. So it's about that cueing system to see that is a prompt and fade. So you would see on the connected text that I went through very quickly, you don't see any of those markings there. It's can they transfer that? But it's about that bridge to help them see that, give them that interaction, and those will be things they're doing on the online platform as well is applying those markings as they learn those skills in that gradual release. One of the things that was so evident in the research on the correlation between motivation and reading outcomes is that for students to maintain motivation, we have to do as educators two things simultaneously. We have to drop the perceived difficulty while increasing student self-efficacy. This was a critical factor for me, even in graduate work and, and, and training and certifying in other programs, is sometimes we confuse complexity with effectiveness. Oh, it's really complex, it's gotta be comprehensive and cover everything. When really overly complex can be a demotivator and, and hinder our results. If it takes too long for students to see results, that can be problematic. So you wanna think about 
the perceived difficulty? How is it being presented, even within the platforms, even within the format? Are we dropping that perceived difficulty for teachers and for students? And are they learning skills that are going to increase that self-efficacy? That's a critical part of maintaining motivation for students. So when we're talking about letter instruction in a blended model. <clears throat> So this is where we start in both programs based on assessment, even for older students, if they're struggling with these, because we know how critical that alphabetic principle is. Do they know those those and those letter sound relationships with automaticity? We're very explicit in the way that we're teaching those letters. The great thing about having a blended approach, you think about, let's say we were teaching this fourth letter group, we teach in letter groups so we can combine it with a vowel for that key purpose of going into phonological blending right away and building to words, which I'll model really quickly. But when we're talking about these letters, when we are introducing it, let's think in those lower elementary grades or for EL students or students who um, have large gaps here, we want to talk about words that start with that sound. So let's say we're teaching the letter T, right? So words that start with that sound. And as a teacher, it's like, okay, well, now I've got to go find some pictures. I want to show some pictures of, you know, and we're kind of pulling from all those places. The nice thing about having an online platform, for example, is there's a preview content tool that teachers can pull up from the administration side and show everything the student is seeing. So you can pull up that content and you can have right there, this is the instruction for letter group four on the online platform form where they're showing words and, or, you know, um, things that start with that sound. And so you can pull that up and use that in your instruction, but the students get that whole nother depth of being able to see and make that connection with that visual, which an online platform can provide. So letter instruction in our approach is always about going sound to sentence. So we start very explicitly with that letter sound, building that oral fluency with that um, slide right away, combining it with a consonant and a vowel, which is a research-based approach, building to those words, they're getting into those print concepts, that critical recognition that every word has to have a vowel, which is why we mark that with an X underneath to identify that pattern. That's also gonna lay the foundation for syllabication later on, because every syllable has to have a working vowel or vowel sound, so how many X's I have is how many syllables creates this great visual connection. Nonsense words are something we want to use in a structured literacy approach to make sure they're understanding those patterns and not just memorizing words. And then we always want to make sure that we're transferring to sentences and then to full connected text. So it's going from that letter to sentence level, always making sure that we're moving in that direction in that blended learning approach. Now, vocabulary is a critical part of what we're doing, that semantics at the word and sentence level, word, phrase, sentence level. Um, for structured literacy. So one of the things that can get left off, which was identified in that four-part processing system by Seidenberg, Aries talked about it in her work, and Louisa Motz um, addresses it in her letters training as well, is the importance of when we're doing phonics, connecting that phonological processor and the orthographic processor, that we need to attach meaning at the same time, which is going to make that more efficient storage and retrieval and make sure we're transferring that to context right away. Another level of using a blended approach um, is that, for example, we have vocabulary tools on both. So when they learn those skills in that instruction, <clears throat> they would go into the vocabulary tool and build words based on that skill. So in the Reading Horizons Discovery, they're building words on that vocabulary word wall, um, getting that definition context sentence, and, and for Elevate, it's more age appropriate. That's the biggest difference in our platforms, age appropriate um, and relevant transfer material for those students. So they're practicing words based on that skill, get a picture, but this looks more like a dictionary for those students in the upper grades. But vocabulary is a great thing that can be utilized in an online platform to extend that breadth of vocabulary knowledge. Spelling is something that has to be, this, this sound symbol association has to be mastered in both directions um, for students to be successful. You know, they come in maybe knowing this is that four part processing system in action. They may know this is cup, but they have to know to spell cup with a C. That orthographic awareness is critical so that they can recognize it in context and produce it in context. So how do we know why to spell for example, cup with C or cat with C and why we spell kitten with a K. I'm going to go ahead and let the software from Elevate teach you this skill really quickly so you can experience a little bit of what the students do in that instruction. When a word begins with the sound K, listen to the vowel sound that comes after the K sound. This tells you if you should spell with a C or with a K. If you hear the sound of A, O, or U, after the k sound, spell the word with a c. If you hear the sound of i or e after the k sound, spell the word with a k. A good way to remember this spelling rule is the rhyme k takes i and e, c takes the other three. 
So that's just a quick example of that explicit instruction, um, what those students are getting. This is for the older students. Um, the younger students would get that as well, but more an age appropriate platform for them as well. But they're getting that explicit instruction and then that practice, a teacher could then reinforce that rule in the classroom. I don't know if that rule was new for any of you. Um, I was an English teacher and didn't know that. I knew the other side intuitively because we I'd been taught I or an E after a C would go to the soft sound. But there's a big difference between being implicit um, and, and maybe just teaching a few roles explicitly or teaching all those skills. And that becomes a powerful part of building that self-efficacy for students. In a structured literacy approach, you'd build systematically from blends to digraph special vowel combinations. So again, in that blended learning model, that software is mirroring that gradual release as well, providing that individualized instruction based on where the students are at, giving that guided practice based on what they need, and then always going to that transfer. So always making sure that what you're doing is mirroring both in your online platform and in the classroom. And then we get into a really powerful part of proving words, not just marking them, but proving them, getting to the why for students to get metacognitive about the most common syllable types when a vowel is going to be short or long. Just to give you a couple of quick examples, we use a spatial process to prove that actually reduces the demand on working memory. So let me show you what I mean, what that process is. So they mark everything underneath left to right. They've been doing that. They know this word is plan. But now we're going to ask them, why is that vowel short and not long? It's what follows those vowels that determine the pronunciation. So we're going to come up and around the end of the word and look at what follows. And the software will gradually release that as well. When we have one consonant following the vowel and nothing else, that consonant, we term it a guardian consonant. The author chose terminology they could anchor to real life. A guardian protects or watches over. It will watch over that short vowel or prove that vowel sound short. So even within both instruction and software, they're learning that process to prove that supports executive function and they're understanding the why. They're learning what those short vowel patterns are, one guardian or two guardians. When the vowel stands alone, it's long. The silent E, the first vowel is long, and the two adjacent vowels, those um, vowel teams. But they're using that spatial process to prove. And then what, what is so great about that data piece too is, for example, those summative assessments. So they learn these skills in chapter three. So I can go in and look at that data and see how Chance did on that chapter test. So for the phonetic skills, he was pretty solid on all of them, but which one? Look at that data. Our RTI status is going to go to a yellow if there's a caution, red if they failed it a couple of times. You can see that Chance struggled with that phonetic skill three, which means Chance then got a refresher, got additional instruction and practice, and then he did well on that refresher. So I know, you know, he did okay with that. I may not need to intervene, um, but then I would get a message in that message center if I need to address that specifically, if he dropped below that a couple of times. But again, that gives you that consistent data, that valid data that Paul talked about, because we know that that explicit instruction has happened based on the student need, and then I can go in as the instructor and decide if I need to address that. Using a familiar framework like these five phonetic skills, it drops that perceived difficulty for concepts like adding inflectional suffixes. Two of the three main orthographic patterns for adding inflectional suffixes are housed here. Um, that phonetic skill one rule is our doubling rule. The phonetic skill four is the dropping rule. And then we can go into that morphology even more. But familiar frameworks, super powerful. This is the last piece of those elements in structured literacy that I'll show you. And then I'm going to show you the resources. But just to show you how quickly this can transfer, we're talking about dropping that perceived difficulty. When we get to multi-syllable words, there's two skills to divide any word of any length. When you realize it's a two-syllable word, which we can see with those two Xs, so clearly be able to identify that. We're going to look at how many consonants are in between those working vowels. When we have one, like in the word motel, we apply decoding skill one, which is that one consonant must go on with the next vowel. So we divide in front of it. Now, here's what's so cool. Once we divide, those syllables will be one of those five skills that I showed you earlier. So that vowel stands alone. It's long in that first syllable. We have that consonant following the vowel in the second syllable, proving it short. On the word campus, I've got a two syllable word again. And this time I have two consonants in between. So I apply decoding skill two, which says two will split. Super easy. I've got a phonetic skill one pattern in that first syllable, same pattern in the second syllable, and the word is campus. That's it. Two decoding skills to divide any word of any length. So the students can be independent and autonomous readers, and they get to have control over their learning in a blended learning model. They get to have their reports. They get their own progress report that tells them where they're at, what goals they've set, um, uh, what they need to address um, when they have when you have conferences with the student you can pull up their report and have them talk through oh, well I struggled here you know and, and what can we do about that what goals do we want to set because we know for motivation and for student success we want them autonomous we want them to be confident 
that's how we create success and how we can do it, particularly in a blended learning model. Because again, the purpose of blended learning um, is, is really to make sure that we're meeting all of the individual needs for students and instructing um, based on that data and tailoring what we're doing in that small group and one-on-one -on -one time with our students. And that's where the, the model can come in. So if you think back about how we started, think back about, so zoom out, for what purpose are we wanting to implement blended learning? And then those questions that Tazi asked, so what's our goal? And, and how are we gonna do it? What resources do we already have? What model do we want to use? And so what resources do we already have? And what can we build? What do we need to get to make blended learning effective in our setting? So those are some of the questions to be mindful of as you're having discussions with your teams um, and looking that in that it's not just about adding technology. It's not just about adding programs. It's about what's our end goal. And the end goal does come back to meeting the needs and especially in an approach like this, meeting the literacy needs of all of our learners, whether we're in the traditional classroom or in the virtual classroom, we can do that with an effective blended learning approach. So available resources very quickly. If you would like to try out the software, both Discovery and Elevate, you can um, drop that in the chat and let us know and we will set you up with a free 30 day trial. So you can look at this online platform, try it out, see what you think, look at the data piece, we'll walk through how to use it with you very quickly. This is a snap snapshot of the Discovery program, age appropriate, super fun, characters that take them on adventures um, to be able to go through that explicit instruction and practice and then Reading Horizons Elevate. You're welcome to get a trial for both. So I know a lot of you are covering grades K6, K8, so you can look at Elevate as well and see what that platform looks like. So just let us know um, and we'll connect you with your specific account executive in your area to set you up on that. The other really cool thing that we're offering free through the end of July, we've been offering it free since COVID hit, um, is our online professional development course for teachers so that you can learn how to do structured literacy, you can learn Reading Horizons, those skills, just to learn those skills and get that professional development. So it is free. Um, that's something that you can talk to your, um, who will connect you with if you'd like to have access for you or any of all of your teachers if you're an administrator. We're offering that free through July. Um, and just know that we are even doing our training virtually. We're providing both virtual and live. We, um, as a blended learning company, we are providing our training in a blended learning model as well. Um, we have that online PD, we have that live instruction, and so we're doing both of those. Reading Horizons Accelerate is that teacher platform where I mentioned you can access any of the materials. That's free. We'll get you set up on there as well if you want to look at those resources. And if you just go to our website, you can find about how to get started in a virtual setting, how to adapt your instruction to a virtual setting, and all of those lessons that I mentioned, those virtual lessons and packets are available for free that you can explore and look through and kind of navigate. So just be thinking through as you're having those conversations, you know, what are we wanting to build? How are we going to do that? What do we need? What are the benefits of the models and how are we, which models do we want to use for our setting? Um, are we utilizing structured literacy based on the science of reading? And can we do it in a blended learning model? Is what we have in place able to pivot in a virtual setting? What does that look like? And those available resources, know what you have at your fingertips. We're happy to share those with you to look at as you're making those decisions. So to wrap up, before we just open it up for questions, I want to do one more poll quickly. What additional resources would be valuable to you? Um, you can mark all that apply. Um, would you like to attend a future webinar or passed on demand? I'll just tell you quickly what ones we have coming up. Would you like to set up a demonstration or a presentation where we're specific for your team, some of your needs and what you'd like to look at? Um, maybe timing's not right, but maybe in the future you'd like to a little bit more. Would you like to just to continue the conversation? And that could imply, I want to just be set up on the free trial. I want to look at that. Um, or you're already currently working with someone at Reading Horizons. Um, so that we know that, um, that you've got that connection already. But if you don't and you'd like that, we'd like to make that connection for you of what would be valuable for you at this time. Please take full advantage of those free resources um, just to look at that and see what's helpful. Um, and I will show you kind of what we're talking about as far as next, we have some upcoming webinars. We're getting specific. Um, this month, if you want to get more in detail about the product and programs themselves, we're focused on discovery, specifically next week on June 18th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And then on the 25th, we're looking specifically at the Elevate program. And then just one that we did a week ago on demand, and you can get previous um, ones on demand. We were um, having a conversation with current customers and how they've used it in that blended learning model um, from teachers to directors. 
you can access that as well. And watch for the email that you're getting tomorrow. You will get an email with the recording of this webinar and it will give you the link to sign up for these upcoming webinars as well. So thank you for being here today. Um, hopefully there were things that can help you get a sense of what um, the blended learning models are, what might be available, give you some questions to start having that conversation about what that looks like. And I know I'm kind of pushing the time, but we'll stay on for a few minutes if you have to go. Thank you for being here. Um, but if you have questions, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. I'm gonna be checking the chat now to see what that's at. Um, also, just if you want more information, I post a lot on Twitter about science of reading and dyslexia and some of the resources. So that's another place that you can connect with me personally, but with Reading Horizons platforms as well. So let's open it up for questions. Um, Nikki and Paul, you're back on. Awesome. Okay, so Heather, that's something, your question, that was something we, it's dependent as far as cost is dependent on, um, and someone raised their hand too, if someone wants to grab that. Um, it depends on what your needs are. And so that's, we'll connect you with the person to talk about because there's a tiered setting and free resources and things like that. So we'll connect you with someone. Um, and awesome. Yes. Okay, so it looks like a lot of you have put in that you'd like to see those. That's awesome. Thank you. You know, the question of cost came up, um, and from my experience, I've, I, I worked a lot in rural school districts where, you know, budget, budgets are very thin, and then I work currently, I, I'm in a 75,000 student school district, and the budgets look much, much different. The great thing about Reading Horizons is it fits in, in any budget. You can make it work, um, but you'll get an email with contact information um, and if you want to reach out to us and get a personalized quote that is specific for your needs, respond to that email and, and we'd love to chat about that. Just a couple other questions that came in. Is the data component only available through the online activities or can I put in my own info? Um, I don't know if you're talking about putting in info from previous assessments. We can actually upload all your students and bring that information in, but it's specific to what we're teaching so that um, we're looking at that data from those specific assessments. Brandy, if I didn't ask that well enough, let me answer that well enough, let me know. Um, Christy, do you have an independent study schools currently using the program? Um, yes, all over. That would be specific to, um, um, I know of ones in different places. So maybe let us know if there's a specific place you're asking about or thinking about. We have 10. Um, I'm involved in some of the research that we're doing here. So 10 standardized um, studies that we're doing. Um, right now, and six of those are for discovery and four of those are for Elevate. We also have independent studies that's been, been done by um, other research firms independent of us that um, have, have wonderful results. And if, if you'd like the white paper on those, uh, just let us know. Good, and you're, and you're asking Christy about specific independent study schools that are using us, right, too? Okay, good, okay, awesome. Good, okay, if we didn't get your question answered, um, when you get that information, we'll be following up with you. You can follow, um, we will follow up again. Um, anything else that we can answer before we leave today? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca, thanks everybody for being here. You all stay safe and well. Thank you.